The main thing about Android malware is that it's really boring. And what's a better way to uh, show how boring it is than the list of bullet points? So these are the bullet points that I think most of you will agree. Has anyone reversed Android malware at all? No? Really? Nobody? Uh, one person. One person. Yeah, one person there. Uh, yeah, so uh, it's really, uh, I don't know why you didn't, but uh, once you do, it's like a lot of remote administration tools, a lot of really, really basic, simple stuff. It's like using the API the way it should use. So just like taking the um, phone information and sending it to the CNC. Uh, usually it's just really, uh, re really basic stuff. And the problem with basic stuff is that we don't want to do basic stuff because it's, it gets boring after a while and we don't have time to do uh, the same thing over and over and again. So um, I created a really simple portal that uh, basically tracks Android malware. So uh, this is the page and it's in this crappy format because my slides are a rectangle. Yeah. Um, so uh, basically what it does is I created some uh, software that has uh, plugins to it and these plugins uh, extract all the useful information about Android malware. So the family type, the CNC address, the well the IP is just uh, a DNS query away and it all gets uh, loaded from the virus total sample database and it all gets, the all information get extracted and you can see the CNC status. Uh, the CNC status is actually uh, done uh, by querying either the URL to see if there is a website there or to see if the port is open if it's a remote administration tool. So re really basic stuff. I don't check if it accepts the connections at all. And it's checked every day, and you have some statistics about it. Of course, the statistics are biased by the way that I gather samples. So, like, I have uh, five families of malware or something like that that I can extract information from. And the statistics are based on these five families of malware. And people seem to like also the visualization part. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so this is the... Uh, yeah, it moves, so... People seem to respond to that. Uh, it's uh, one of the families called Porn Locker. So it's an Android app that pretends to be a porn app and locks your phone demanding ransom. Uh, yeah, it's really popular. <laughs> uh, and this is one of the families, because there are many families that do that. This is one of them. And you can clearly see the connections between IPs and the domains and samples. So the samples are in red, uh, domains are in green, and IPs are in bluish color. And you can see that there are uh, basically two campaigns because all these are connected somehow, right? And all of these are somehow also connected. So we can move it around. Uh, so yeah. Basically, the main reason for this uh, visualization was to uh, see how connected are the different campaigns of the same malware. So this is all the information that I could gather about one family. And, well, it has a nice visual to it. Uh, it also has some, st some API where you can extract information about live CNCs, about families of malware, or about new entries. Uh, and you can do with the, this information whatever you want, uh, basically feed it to some uh, IDS or IPS system. Anyhow, uh, this was the boring part. We got it out of our way. And now we go to the good stuff. So the good stuff is the samples that I was able to find, and they were somehow interesting. So you will see a random bits and pieces of uh, I think interesting malware, and they use a couple of different technologies, so uh, something you wouldn't think uh, Android is capable of, like .NET, Lua, 
uh, we will have some time uh, playing with uh, XML and uh, live journal. I don't know if I have time to say it, but well, we'll try. Let's start with Android manifest. Who of you knows Android manifest file at some point? And you didn't reverse Android applications, but you do know the Android manifest. So when you write an application, Android manifest is like uh, a place where you declare all the, all the important stuff, the package name, the permissions, the broadcast receivers, all the stuff that uh, what basically makes um, meta information of the app. And this Android manifest.xml, if you ever wrote it or used an ID to wrote it, it, it's an XML, and then it gets somehow compressed into a binary file. So, uh, this binary file is, of course, not an XML. It's not like a zip compression. It's meant to uh, deduplicate strings, but it also has some really interesting features. And, uh, well, if you bear with me for, I guess, three slides or something, and uh, I will show you some cool stuff that you can do with it. So, um, Android manifest.xml, as you find it in the APK package, is just basically a binary blob that always starts with these two numbers, the blue and the uh, red one. The blue one says that it's an XML, and the red one is the uh, header size. So uh, header size is eight, because there are eight bytes there. Simple enough. And then you have the XML size in the yellowish color. Uh, so the XML size is 1EA8. You read it from uh, right to left. Then you come to a section called string pool, and this section defines uh, all the strings. So the main reason for this compression is that strings are not repeated. So if you have XML, like you have a lot of repeated strings probably. So uh, using this compression, you only have one string. Uh, and it declares that it's a string pool. Again, the blue means the type of thing that comes. Uh, then you have the header length, uh, header length uh, it's 1C, and then you have the content length, uh, it's E78. And you then declare the number of strings, 42 in hexadecimal, and you declare the base of the strings, it's one, one, 1 to 4, and the next string. So it's like 1 to 4 plus 0 uh, is somewhere here. And for those, you, those of you who are paying attention, it's not exactly one to four because there was a XML header at the beginning and the offset is like relative to the, uh, to the place of the string pool. So, uh, well, almost one to four is here and you can see that it's version code. Uh, the, first, uh, two, uh, the first two bytes are the size of the string and then you have version code. Uh, it's the same for the red one. It starts here with the size, and then you have version name, and so on, and so on. Okay, that's not really that interesting, but um, each of the strings, well, most of the strings, have what's called resource ID. So that's the next section after the strings, and you declare that it's a resource ID section. Here is the header, line, uh, header length, here is the resource, uh, resource map, it's called. Uh, resource map section, and here is the first resource ID. Uh, you also read it from right to left. So this resource ID is um, uh, is supposed to be the identification number for the first string, so the version code string, and then you have the second resource ID, and so on and so on. So uh, this resource IDs, uh, well, there are usually less resource IDs than there are uh, strings. So like if you um, write an app that's basically a hello world, you will probably see uh, that the version code has some resource ID and then next strings have up to some point. And after that point, no of the strings have resource ID. All these resource IDs can, you can find here. Uh, they are declared in the Android source code. So like you can find that this ID represents text color secondary or something. But uh, what is interesting about it is that you can see that string is identified by two things. First is the string itself, and then is the resource ID. So how do you think? 
the, is the resource ID more important or is the string content more important or does the Android check actually whether the resource ID is what is supposed to be for the string? Um, well, I guess most of you have probably guessed that uh, resource ID is the important stuff. Android doesn't care about what the string content actually is. So, like you can have in a famous case, I guess it's called DexGuard protector. Uh, it just shipped some of the strings and you just had only the resource IDs. So we had like this resource ID equals one or something. And you didn't know what the string was. So um, this probably is the version name. I'm just guessing. You have to go to the XML and check it yourself. Um, so this thing um, does one interesting thing that uh, usually when you try to uh, make Android manifest XML again, you have to have like an attribute and a value. And here you don't have attribute, you only have the, uh, the resource ID. So let's play with that. Um, here you have something that will be decoded from the Android manifest presented above. And you have two package entries, right? That's usually not allowed uh, in XML ever. Like you cannot have two attributes that have the same name. So it's not even an XML, not, uh, not speaking about uh, Android manifest XML. How that came to be? So uh, this Android manifest has a interesting name of the attribute. Android version name equals 1.0 package. This is the attribute name. And the attribute value is com.acme.app. So this is the attribute name, right? And this is the attribute value. And here you can see that package equals, well, something else. And here you can see the second attribute. So uh, by using this technique, if you have like an automated way of processing Android, um, malicious applications, you, uh, the, probably the tool that you use will just throw an error and will, won't know what the package name really is. Well, if you use, for example, APK tool, it also translates to this XML. So like you have this XML without colors and you have package equals something and then package equals something. And this app actually installs on any modern Android version up to 6.0 uh, without any problems. And well, uh, you can try it too. I wrote a small tool that can obfuscate it. And you can see what happens when you, for example, put a carriage return in the, uh, in the attribute name. Because if you put a carriage return, then if you display it with less, whole line gets erased and, starts, and it starts a new one. Uh, you can play with string size, you can play with backspace characters, which will also be rendered as backspace characters in some of the editors. And uh, there are sandboxes out there who, which print Android manifest.xml, so they take the Android manifest from the APK, translate it to XML, and, they, and then print it. And while maybe they don't display it properly, so we can put HTML stuff in there, and see what happens. So, uh, time for a small demo. Let's just start a new one. Um, so, write this and, yep. Uh, and if you go to the tool, you can see that, well, I'll minus a, I wrote a small hello world app. Well, it looks like a normal app. You have the package name, version name, whatever version code. It looks like Android manifest file. So uh, if you look at the configuration file, it says that you should replace the version name with this value. This value is somewhat unreadable because uh, while well, it's UTF-16 encoded and I didn't want to use the Python handling of Unicode because uh, in Python 207, 2.7, I don't really understand how the encoding works. And well, it will change the version name to something called version equals 1.0, then there will be a new line sign, a lot of spaces, and A equals package or something. 
let's see what happens. So like this, and I don't have tab here. And if you look at it, um, you can see that we have now two package entries, right? This one and this one. It's just because, well, the version name uh, got changed to version name equals 1.0, here's a new line character, a bunch of spaces and A. So this actually is, the version name is here. And if you look up that string ID, you will come up with the version name, but nobody cares to do that because, well, you have package and you have resource ID, so it's probably okay. Anyhow, that uh, should install normally, and just to show you that it installs normally. Oh, sorry. I didn't sign it. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's exactly the password. Uh, yeah, so it's, it installs normally. And uh, if you don't believe me, I can show you the Android version is 6.0. So you can do a lot of stuff with Android manifest. Uh, I guess it's not like you can exploit anything uh, apart from the people that are reversing Android apps. And well, let's go to the, um, to the part when I talk about most interesting malware I ever found. I guess. Uh, it uses Lua and it uses Mono, so uh, it starts like there's a receiver for uh, text messages declared in the Android manifest, and it has code in Java. So there's a, a bit of Java code that what it does is it uses something called leader.dll to register z.core.sms receiver to handle the text messages. So it's all the code. There is only one uh, line that registers the DLL library in the native code. What this library does, this native IRM uh, library, is that it's basically a mono runtime, like from Linux, when you run .NET applications. So uh, it uses a code in mono in .NET to handle text messages. But it's not only that. Actually, the code in Mono does, uh, or .NET, uh, does um, other stuff. It doesn't handle the message. It just downloads a Lua script from the CNC server to handle the message. So you have like, you start with Java, then you go to the native code, to Mono, and then to Lua, virtual machine that is based on Mono. Uh, what they, why did they do it? Uh, well, obfuscation is the main reason, I guess, but also uh, if you get the APK itself, uh, it only has the code to download Lua from the server, so you don't know what actually they do with the text messages, because it's all on the server, and if you don't have access to CNC, to live CNC, you cannot download the code and see what it does. So it's uh, here, the, uh, the Lua code, uh, thanks to friends from Lookout. Um, and what it does is really basic, and I was, well, uh, a little disappointed in it. So, like, it checks your balance in different kinds of prepaid wallets or, uh, or your balance in your prepaid card and something like that. Uh, yeah, but the reason is it's written in Lua, right? And it runs, runs on Android, so... Uh, I think that's a uh, really, really interesting part of it. And, well, yeah. So, uh, and these guys also know how to do encryption. At least they seem to know how to do it. Like, the communication protocol is somewhat complex. They um, choose, a, well, they contact the CNC for a random uh, RC4 key. They get the key. Then they encrypt the packets using that key, but they encrypt an AES key, so like they encrypt AES in RC4, and then they use this AES, which is a kind of session key, to uh, handle all the communication, and when the phone restarts, for example, they use the RC4 key again, and they choose other AES key 
to encrypt the communication. So, uh, yeah, they know how to do it. And from what I gather, the, the main idea that they do it is, of course, to steal money from your prepaid account or something like that. But they also uh, run a casino affiliate pro program. When, when you display ads, you get like money for it. So uh, they run a browser on your Android phone when you're probably not watching or something. And they open the website which serves ads and they get money by doing that. Uh, easy idea. But it works, right, for them. And also they have a code, uh, not in Lua, in .NET, that locks your phone. I didn't see them use it at all in any of the cases that, uh, that I've seen, but they have the code to lock your phone and to display a ransom message uh, to you. I guess it's not finished yet because they have some bugs in there, so maybe they are working on it. Uh, and in the next version, uh, it will do something like that. Okay, uh, so we had Lua, we had Mono. Why not add JavaScript to the mix? And Android does, well has this uh, really interesting thing when you can expose some JavaScript function. So like you create a web view in your application, a browser, and you create some new JavaScript function that the page can call in order to get something. And this is, uh, this is a part of small, simple blocker ransomware that was run on Android. And it exposes three, uh, three functions to the JavaScript. You can see it by the annotation JavaScript interface. This just means that the function will be exposed to the website. So there are three functions, exec from execute, retrieve uh, JS messages, and set native to JS breach mode. The, the, the last one is just for management purposes. The execution one, it just executes what you want in shell, in Android shell. So like they create a browser, go to a website when the attacker can just write in JavaScript what they want to execute on the infected user's phone. Uh, it's also a pretty popular way to, for example, expose your images. So there was a Android ransomware that took a photo with the front cam of you just to display your photo because this works on some people. And it exposed the photo in the same way using JavaScript. So like you called a JavaScript function, put the photo here, and the uh, photo appeared. Even it wasn't sent to the CNC server at all. It just was all done locally by JavaScript and Android. So this is the, uh, the, the, the really fun stuff that they can execute an, almost anything. I don't know how they use it. They just probably use it from uh, what I think. They just probably use it to like unlock your phone when you pay the ransom. Uh, because while well, the ransomware guys, generally on Windows, Android, and any other platform, I guess, are really, are really nice. If you pay the ransom, they will actually unlock your phone and they won't steal like any passwords or something. They will just unlock your phone. So yeah, this is customer loyalty. So when the next time you will, you will lock your phone and pay, you know you, are, you have guaranteed results, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, but it's, well, if the word got out that they actually don't decrypt your files or unlock your phone, nobody would pay, right? <laughs> uh, there's also another uh, technique that uh, malicious application use. It's called application overlay. And uh, it's a really simple way to do a social engineering kind of like technique. So when you open an app on your phone, like your e-banking app or Facebook or something like that. Um, the, applica the malicious application can uh, check what's running in the foreground of the Android phone. And if it's like your e-banking app, it can display a window on top of it asking for your login and password. So most of the users are uh, encouraged to give their passwords just because uh, they think that's the application that's asking for it, not the malicious application, but the actual e-banking application. And you can see it here. Uh, the actual Gmail app is in the background, right? And the malicious application is in the front. 
Uh, but you cannot dis distinguish between them, right? Well, I don't know if you can. Uh, I guess the, the writing <laughs> helps a bit, but you don't have the right red writing on uh, your Android phone. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it's really hard to do that. And they actually went uh, a little bit overboard with that. So like they constructed an Android malware that uh, is based on that idea. It's heavily based on that idea. Is any of you familiar with web, inje web injects from uh, Windows malware? Yeah. Anyone? Yeah. yeah. Um, so um, it's a poor man's version of it. You can think of it like that. So when you open, uh, for example, the contact app, it's like Facebook for the Russian users. Um, the malicious application asks for, uh, well, uh, running tasks. So it uses get running tasks. And get running tasks is a function that returns all, all the tasks that are running in the order that they appear on the user screen. So like if you have something on front, it will be uh, the first return value and then the second and so on. And if the running task is, for example, com v contact the Android, then it asks the CNC server if it can provide any HTML for that application. And then it displays the HTML on top of the vcontact app, like uh, in a web view or something like that. Uh, so uh, previously, this one was hard coded in the malware. So we knew which applications were targeted, how the uh, pop up looked like, and so on. But now they, uh, they well, went a level higher. So we don't know which application they target. We don't know what the pop-up will look like and what are they using and they can change it any time basically without changing any application code at all. They just have to write some HTML in the panel. And uh, Google made the, their life a bit harder because since Lollipop, the uh, get, was it get recent tasks or get running apps, get running uh, tasks, right. Um, since Lollipop, this method is deprecated because uh, of the privacy reasons. That's the official statement. So like, because in Lollipop, you have uh, different documents open in different uh, windows. So uh, the official statement is that you can uh, see the document's names and it uh, violates your privacy if the app can see the documents you have opened. Uh, but it had a side effect of blocking the app of application overlay method. And well, so it's a kind of security measure. And the fun part is uh, this note. This method is only intended for debugging and presenting task management user interfaces. This should never be used for core logic in application, such as deciding between different behaviors based on the information found here. So the bad guys are not uh, API compliant in that way. And well, they were asked really nicely to not do that. I don't know why they did it. Uh, so finally it got deprecated since Android 5.0 and it doesn't work in Android 5.0. Uh, but they still wrote the malicious app after Android 5.0 was published. It, it's, this malware is like from a couple of months ago. So I guess they still make money out of it uh, because not that many people are switched to Lollipop or, or Marshmallow. Okay, but that's one of the um, main obstacles in new Android malware development. There's, there are other uh, problems with it. Since Android KitKat, um, there is a different way that the text messages are handled. Previously, it was like this. So um, all the applications that wanted uh, to read text messages just registered that they want to receive uh, SMS received action. And they were, um, they were given the text of the message in the order of priority. So the malicious app went to the highest priority and then just simply aborted broadcast. So the message was not, uh, was not uh, given to the default messaging app. So you couldn't see the text message that uh, came to your phone. But since Android KitKat, you have like 
Uh, you have two uh, different intents. There's, there's SMS received, which works exactly the same way as it used to work. And there is another SMS deliver, which goes to only one application. Again, the official line was that uh, they are trying to switch between the default text message application to Hangouts. So uh, they want to create an intent that will do just that, right? So you, have, you can have one uh, text message application because you, if you had both of them, you will see text messages in both of them and this would be troublesome for, uh, for users. Uh, so they created an intent con called SMS Deliver and it had a side effect of uh, while well, displaying all the messages. And why displaying all of the messages is important, because when uh, attackers infect your phone, they usually do that to gain access to one-time passwords that come uh, via text message. And if you don't see the one-time password, because they logged in on your computer and they got the login and password information and wanted to do wire transfer, they infected your phone, your phone received a one-time password, and it didn't display it to you because the, the application aborted broadcast, you uh, don't know that the wire transfer went through. You have to log into your, uh, on your computer to see the history of the account. And when, uh, well, since Android KitKat, you will get the message, uh, even though the uh, attackers would probably get away with, wire, with doing wire transfer, you are notified as soon as the wire transfer is made so you can block it on, uh, on your bank's site, for example. Okay, and uh, well, there are ways to circumvent that. One of the ways to, they did it is they muted the audio. So when you receive a text message, uh, you won't get an audio notification about it. Uh, I know it's like, well, very simple way to uh, to get around it, you will actually see the text message. You won't hear the noise uh, that your phone makes. Uh, but that's, there's one interesting stuff in, in that code that they did. They uh, check if the version release starts with 4.4. So if it's KitKat, but uh, if you know, for example, Lollipop, it starts with 5.8 and 5.0 and Marshmallow starts with 6.0, so it only works on KitKat, this muting part, not any uh, other Android above, which has the same functionality, uh, yeah. The other thing that they did is they used actual open source project called uh, Secure SMS, or is it Text Secure now? Uh, it's from the guys that made the red phone, and the code is open source, so they downloaded it from GitHub, added some parts of uh, their code, their malicious code, and distributed it as a way to make your text messages more secure, right? So it actually did the functionality of the text secure, but apart from that, uh, it, also, uh, it also hides your uh, one-time passwords that you get from the bank and it forwards them to the attackers. So, yeah, you cannot find it on Google Play. They distributed it via, uh, I guess, some, some way of Windows malware or something like that. Um, and now uh, we're on to the tips and tricks part. So, um, what uh, the guys are really inventive on, uh, well, the attackers are really inventive. And they uh, wrote a small, very basic, very simple app that uh, the main idea was to forward text messages to some number. So like uh, the, uh, and the communication channel, the CNC channel was only text messages based. There was no HTTP, HTTP connection whatsoever. Um, so they sent a text message to the application and if it started with a forward slash, it meant start forwarding messages to the number specified in the message. And uh, I know none of you speak Polish, and it's not a very good Polish, but I can guess a gist of it. So it's supposed to look like a spam message where you can win Samsung 4G phone or something if you just uh, pay 66 uh, US dollars. So it looks like a normal spam message. And what the uh, Android malware did 
is it showed the forward slash, so it meant start forwarding messages, and it got a number from the message just by uh, concatenating all of the numbers found there. So uh, yeah, it's it's a really simple and basic idea. If the user is in fact that he won't see that message, and if he, if the user has KitKat or above or is not infected, he will just ignore the message because it's a kind of spam. And if you add all those numbers to well and form a string and form form a number, uh, you could see uh, where they forwarded the message. Um, but they didn't check for the CNC uh, number, so like they didn't actually uh, have any number hard coded, and they didn't check if the message was coming from the attacker. Any message that came with the forward slash and then a number meant that the messages start forwarding. Any message that came with the comma uh, meant that th uh, the phone should stop forwarding the messages. Any message that started with hash meant that uh, you have the phone has to send device info to the attacker, and any message that started with the exclamation point meant that application should uninstall itself. Um, so, uh, well, some of the banks in Poland started sending one-time password, starting with exclamation point. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, well, you know, it's like this, uh, you think of it like a stupid idea because they can change the exclamation point to anything, right? But it turns out that the, guy, the guys bought the malware. They actually didn't know how to write it. So they didn't know how to change the exclamation point to anything other. And they just dropped it and move on to the other malware that had, well, different functionality and so on. Uh, so, yeah, uh, well, and the bank sent, sent it with the exclamation point. It didn't do anything to your phone apart from the fact that, um, well, it, installed, uh, it uninstalled malware from your phone. Uh, yeah, but, uh, well, I don't, think even, I don't think that users even noticed it. Will you notice it? You probably don't even read the text message. You just look for the code. Uh, well, maybe you do, but <laughs> um, not that many users uh, noticed it. Um, there's another another tip and trick uh, which Android mal malware can use. Uh, I saw it in a legitimate application. Uh, I didn't see it in any malware, but I think they are uh, getting to it. So if you send a text message, you have this part called user data he headers. And it, uh, it is responsible, well, the, I guess the most common use is if you send like two or three messages and you want to have one big long message, the user data, the data header is where the information is stored, uh, how to compose the message, which one comes first, which one comes second, if you have whole message. Uh, but other um, useful feature of user data header is that you can send a text message to a port like two byte port, think of it like more or less like the TCP. And it's used for uh, VAP push messages, WAP messages, but it can also be, you can use any port you'd like, and some ports are of course free, so that means that the phone doesn't do anything with that message by default. It doesn't display it, it doesn't, uh, well, put any audio notification, you don't even know you received it. Uh, so the use for the for this legitimate application was that it was a banking application, and they used SMS as a kind of secure second channel to send messages. So if you uh, made wire transfer on your banking app, they send you a text message, and you you uh, well you um, didn't have to uh, find the code in the message. They just made the communication possible by, via uh, SMS text message port. Uh, it's also a nice way to, uh, one of the researchers showed it, it's also a nice way to know if the user is connected to the network because you get the text message report back saying that the user got the message and the user doesn't see the message actually at all. 
so you can just check if someone is connected to the network without them knowing uh, at all. And it also works, I didn't try it, but it also is supposed to work on iOS, so iOS also doesn't do anything with these messages, so you can test on your uh, iPhone. There's an application that can do that. Uh, I know it works in my network, on my Android, and I didn't see the message, uh, despite the fact that I got the message. So, yeah, that's maybe something for the future, uh, but it's used in the uh, legitimate applications. And now uh, let's move on to the buzzword of the year, I guess, so, or the last year. I don't know what's the buzzword of this year. Um, advanced persistent threats. So like we saw a lot of uh, leaks uh, this year and last year uh, about applications that are uh, bought by states to monitor your, uh, your phones or something like that. Uh, I guess the first big leak was from FinFisher uh, and their application called FinSpy. Have any, has any of you heard about FinFisher or FinSpy or, yeah, yeah, I guess so. And what, what they did is it had a really nice functionality. Well, the code was um, more or less spotless, like you had you really know that they have unit tests and they test the code heavily and they know the coding standards. So it was nice to read it. And what they had a nice feature. Uh, the WhatsApp application, the instant messaging application, um, had a small security problem a couple of years ago, I guess, uh, that they made a backup of all your messages onto your SD card. So anyone could read the backup. It was, of course, encrypted. Every backup was encrypted with the same key, which was hard-coded to the application. Uh, yeah, they changed it since then, but uh, yeah, that was the, the state then. This is the key, and the fin part of the key. And the FinSpy application actually stole that messages. Uh, so it uh, found it on the SD card because the, well, the place where they stored the backup was also hard coded in the application. And so they read the backup database, they decrypted it using the hard coded key, they parsed it, and they sent the messages back to the CNC server and to the attackers. So yeah, that's, uh, that's also something to think about that your application may be targeted by some malware. It happens, it's not like, uh, uh, a fairy, fairy tale that we just tell people that they would be afraid of uh, using applications. But really, if you're, a, if you're an app developer, you should think about security of your app. And I guess that most of you heard about Hacking Team. Is there someone who hasn't heard about Hacking Team? No, okay. So uh, they had a big uh, leak, I think think that all of the data was stolen. And they had uh, some solution for uh, Android uh, exploits or Android malware. And their solution was, I have to say, pretty much ingenious. They created, a, they wanted to create, well, they did at some point, uh, a useful app. So the app that you will actually use. And they uploaded it to the Google Play Store. It was a simple news application, so you get the news that you are interested in. Uh, it looked a little bit uh, unfinished, but well, um, yeah, it shows you the, the news and it's really, uh, well, um, I guess the users wanted to use it. So uh, apart from that functionality that it shows news, at some point, Instead of the news, you would get an Android exploit that will install a root shell on your device. And this root shell also was custom made, so it had like really weird comments that were, uh, well, obfuscated in a way, I guess. So you wouldn't know that you have a root shell. It also installed in a, uh, in a specially designated place that only they know how to uh, how to access. So, uh, and then if the exploit succeeded, I think I have a diagram here. If the exploit succeeded, 
uh, and they installed the root shell. They used that root shell to install what they call an agent. And this was just basically a remote administration tool application that uh, stole your messages, monitored what you do on your phone, and had the root access, so you, it can do pretty much anything. Um, the interesting part that they did is that um, Android has an out-of-memory uh, killer, so uh, you may know it from uh, Linux machines, but on Android it's like um, really, um, mm, well, it really works kind of, um, how to say it, um, it uh, if the application uh, is using too much memory, it will just get killed, even if it's not like using whole memory, it can just be using too much memory, and it will get killed because the new application needs memory. So like, if you didn't use application for a long time and it uses memory, it will get killed. Uh, it's a useful feature, I guess, and uh, but it also has a, threshold and the adjustment, so if you like put on your process ID that you don't want your, your application to get killed, uh, you can do that, and they actually did it, but you can only do that if you rooted your phone, no, and well, well, they did root your phone uh, to install the agent, so this was a nice feature. But overall, uh, it's like, um, even if you installed it from the Play Store and you weren't uh, the point of the interest of the someone who bought uh, the uh, hacking team solution, you won't get the exploit because the exploit was, uh, first of all, it was encrypted with your phone random key that they assigned for you. And the second, uh, second thing that they checked was the email number. So I, E, M, I. I don't know how to you pronounce it in French. Yeah, uh, uh, number. So uh, it only got delivered to the person that they were they were interested in. So despite being on the Google Play Store, uh, you probably wouldn't get exploited if you weren't uh, interesting enough for them. Uh, yeah. So uh, that's all, I guess.